Hey y'all, Tom, ND3N here, and thanks for dropping in for a Ham Shack chat. This time we're going to be looking at seven things about ham radio operations that they don't teach in any of the books that you might study. These are listed with no particular order of importance, inferred or implied. This video focuses mostly on new hams. They're brand new. But it might be of some interest to those of us with a few years behind the microphones. If you would like to add some of your own observations, make corrections to my observations, or just toss out a random remark, please make copious use of the comment section. I've got a comment and a question. There are times when you are operating that you can get really frustrated because there might be a pile up or for a multitude of other reasons, you're not able to get recognized for a QSO. So you do what many people do when they get frustrated. You begin to shout into your microphone. This is not a good thing to do for several reasons. First, shouting raises your blood pressure and triggers your flight or fight instinct. This leads to increased anxiety and a higher level of frustration, which is the exact opposite of what you need at that moment. Second, raising your voice to a shout will cause your rig to start to clamp down on your audio level, which distorts your voice so you become less understandable Again, the exact opposite of what you really need at the moment. The proper way to hold your microphone is to hold it two to three inches away from your mouth, speak in a calm, relaxed voice, and speak across the microphone instead of directly into it. Training yourself to properly use your microphone will lessen your stress, make operating a lot more enjoyable and less stressful, and in the end, increase the number of QSOs you make. Now this applies to all bands and modes, from HF SSV to VHF and UHF FM, and to all types of rigs, from HTs to mobiles to base stations. In my opinion, one of the most useless accessories and also most expensive is a linear amplifier. Now, as a caveat, I have never used an amplifier and never transmitted a signal greater than 100 watts. For digital modes, I keep my power below 50 watts and many times use lower power and even QRP for these modes. Okay, now you're just showing off. <laughs> The difference between 100 and 1000 watts is 10 dB, or ballpark rule of thumb, in the range of 1.5 S units. That's up to S9, and the difference between S9 and S9 plus 10. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that much difference. Certainly not enough to spend two to three thousand dollars or more plus more money to upgrade your antenna systems to handle the increased power. Think about what you could add to your shack if you had the money instead of the amp. This is like mind boggling. By the way, an old Elmer of mine told me that a dime spent on an antenna is worth a dollar spent on an amplifier. After nearly four decades of experience, I believe he was being conservative in his estimate. Thanks for watching this video. If you found it useful, interesting, and maybe even a little entertaining, please take a moment to pop that thumbs up icon and give me a like. You like me. You really like me. Yes, I know you can look at the ads and the owner's manuals for almost every rig, and they'll tell you that it has an internal antenna tuner. Now, if it doesn't have one internally, it will have a port that can be used to drive an external tuner. My 991A has both, and I generally use the external tuner. That said, these are not antenna tuners. The only way to tune an antenna is by making physical adjustments to the antenna itself. Even then, it will be optimized at a specific frequency or set of frequencies, and if you get away from that frequency, it will not be tuned. Take a look at the chart on the side, and you can see that there's a center frequency now on, say, 80 meters. If you tune your radio to a CW frequency, say, 
3540. If you get more than about 20 hertz on either side of where you tuned it, you're going to probably want to tune it again. Now, what we call antenna tuners are better termed impedance matching network. And they put your signal through a network of capacitors and inductors to make the antenna appear to match the usual 50 ohm impedance from your rig. It should be noted that the antenna's impedance doesn't change. It just makes the transfer of power from the rig to the radiator more efficient. The impedance mismatch is rated by the standing wave ratio. A perfect match of 50 ohms on both the rig and the antenna has an SWR of 1 to 1, or 1 1.0 to 1. A mismatched antenna, say with 150 ohms impedance, would have a SWR of 3 to 1, 3 times 50. Generally, you want to use an impedance matching network to tweak your antenna's apparent match to 1.5 to 1, or a range of 33 to 75 ohms impedance. Now there is a tool you can use to get your antenna in the ballpark so less work has to be done, and that's called an antenna analyzer. Now these range in price, but the better ones can be a bit expensive, and they're not something you're going to use every day. So check with your local club or group of friends to see if they have one they can loan you while you make the initial adjustments to your antenna. In an impossibly perfect world, we could go out and purchase an antenna that would tune everything from DC to light. He's absolutely perfect. But physics, math, and wires all limit what we have to work with. So do use an antenna tuner, but be aware of their limits, operate within those limits, and please occasionally use the proper terminology of impedance matching network. Between you and me, people will think you're smarter than you are. There's a time to talk and a time to remain silent. Now, there are a number of nets all over the bands. On the HF bands, there are nets for RVers, mobile operators, missionaries, and I've even heard of a grandfather clock enthusiast net. Now, that's just to name a few. There are hundreds. You'll also find nets happening on VHF and UHF FM and the VOIP chats happening all the time. Most importantly, in times of emergency, you'll find nets that are passing information and providing support about that emergency. Before jumping into a net, listen and decide if your input would be of value to the net. For example, we'll go back to the emergency net. You should have the proper training, for example, before jumping into a net that is supporting emergency operations during a hurricane. You should have taken the National Weather System training as a weather spotter, and you should have information concerning the hurricane. During a net supporting, say, an earthquake emergency, you should have the appropriate RACES or ARIES training and have information concerning the earthquake. During a hobbyist net, you should either share that hobby or maybe have a question about the hobby, then wait for the net control to open the net to new check-ins. You'll probably be welcome. Probably. Now, I could go on, but it's really just common sense and manners. If there's any question on whether or not to speak up and get into the net, listening is usually the best answer. The next thing that I want to talk about will probably be the most controversial of this list. Most of us enjoy freedom of speech, and we understand the responsibilities that come with this right. However, we also understand that there are consequences to the misuse of this right. Unfortunately, and especially with ham radio, those consequences may not affect the person exercising their freedom of speech. Now that I've confused many of you and probably I'm confused, triggered a few of you, my apologies, please let me explain my thinking. While we in many countries enjoy freedom of speech, there are many countries where the citizens do not. At the extreme, there are several countries where even listening to certain types of speech can result in arrest, imprisonment, or even execution. Active participation in certain forms of speech 
can result in the same. There are even countries where the ownership of a ham radio or other shortwave listening device is forbidden and the mere possession will result in immediate punishment and the governments of these countries are actively monitoring the airwaves. While we might take our freedom of speech for granted and feel comfortable in talking about politics, religion, and other sensitive topics, our brother and sister hams in certain countries can suffer consequences almost beyond our comprehension for even listening to our free speech. Keep this in mind as you chat with your friends because your friends might not be the only ones listening. Uh, just another short break before we move on to my final comments. I'd like to ask you to help get the word out about this and other of my videos by sharing. I think sharing a bathroom sounds fun. Then with your friends, family, and compatriots in the ham radio community, especially on social media. Now, back to my ramblings. Ham radios come in all price ranges. I generally shy away from the very cheap ones, mostly because I believe they use substandard parts and are generally knockoffs of better and therefore more expensive radios. Conversely, I don't always go with the most expensive radio available either. Because they may have impressive features and operating conveniences, these same features and conveniences will soon become standard with mid-cost radio. Just wait a year or two. Wait for it. Mid-cost radios, at least in my opinion, meet the monetary sweet spot between cost and function. You may note that I haven't specified a dividing line between cheap, mid-cost, and expensive. This is because how much you can afford compared to other hams is up to you to decide. Don't feel like you have to keep up with the Joneses, but don't buy the newest, most expensive rig on the market every year unless you really want to. I remember something I heard on the radio several years ago, and they were talking about new drivers. And they were describing a scene where a 16-year-old kid was explaining to a policeman, gee, officer, I aced my driver's test, so I couldn't have run into that bridge abutment. In the same manner, I've actually seen a new ham, probably had his ticket for two weeks. And he was talking to an extra class operator with a few decades of experience. No, it, it wasn't me. And challenging the older ham with the fact that he had got 100% on his technician's exam, so there was nothing further for him to learn. Well, my friends, getting your ham radio ticket, really at any level, I'm including upgrades here, is a key that opens many doors for you. Once you get your tech ticket, there are a lot of modes, rigs, and frequencies available beyond working a repeater with a simple FM handheld. And as you progress up through the license classes, there are just more doors and more experiences available to you. If your interest in ham radio begins to fade, try a new mode. If you're tired of talking, play with some of the digital modes. If you're tired of the canned messages in FT8, try PSK, ready or slow scan TV. And if you're tired of all of that, there are always organizations like Aries and Racy's where you can support your community in times of extreme need. I've read somewhere that a mine once expanded never shrinks back to its original size. In the same way, your first ham radio ticket provides access to lifelong learning and continuous new experiences in the radio art. Never assume that you know everything, nor should you assume that you can't learn anything further. Whether you've been a ham for a week or many years, there is always something new to learn and experience. You have the key. Now go out and start opening some doors. Now, I could have continued this stream of consciousness almost infinitely, but I think this is a good time to bring this video to an end. This video has been a bit of an anomaly to me, but please leave a comment and let me know what you think. Also, please remember to like and share this video and please consider subscribing. I certainly appreciate it. 73 until the next Hey Y'all. As always, I'm at your service. This has been a Hamshack Chat. I'm Tom, ND3N, just like it says on the hat. 
and I am out. I guess it's over. <laughs>